So yeah, sadly I didn't come with a with a robe or a lightsaber. Um, the mic will have to do. <laughs> so today I'm going to be talking about IBC light clients and why I believe they are the lightsaber for the IBC Jedi. So a little bit about myself first. As Peter said, I'm Adithya. I'm a protocol architect for IBC, and I was one of the core engineers that brought the first IBC implementation to market in the Cosmos ecosystem. Um, and before that, I was working in the Ethereum ecosystem on Plasma, which I think of as a very early predecessor to rollups. So I spent a lot of time thinking about scalability and interoperability, and in my view, they kind of converge on the same design space, and I'm here to tell you why. I think IBC is the, makes the right trade-offs for that design space, and why light clients are such an important part of that. Cool. So this is the current state of bridging. Uh, in Ethereum and in most ecosystems, it's pretty simple. We have a lock smart contract on one end, let's say on Ethereum, and I can deposit maker tokens into that smart contract, and the smart contract will put that in escrow. And then we have this third party bridge operator, which is a centralized entity that recognizes that, creates a signed attestation, and sends it on to another chain. Let's say that other chain is Solana. Then we have a smart contract here that verifies that signature from the centralized trusted party and then mints me some wrapped maker tokens on Solana. And I can play that in reverse, burn my minted tokens here on Solana and get the central operator to sign something that releases my tokens again on Ethereum. So there's some pros and cons to this approach. We see it all over the place. And the reason we see it all over the place is because it's extremely simple to deploy, right? You build two smart contracts, you create a server with a private key, boom, you can move billions of dollars just like that. But there are a ton of cons, right? As we already heard, the major con here is this trusted third party, right? This trusted third party is verifying everything for the two chains, right? Ethereum doesn't know anything about Solana. Solana doesn't know anything about Ethereum. They're both completely reliant on this third party operator to tell them what's happening. So. If that third party is malicious or just incompetent and loses its private keys, that attacker can steal all of the funds from the bridge just by signing whatever attestation it wants. But some attacks are just from an implementation bug in the bridge operator that happened in Nomad and a bunch of other bridge hacks we've seen. And I think this is also a problem with all of these bridge solutions is that they have the same kernel of an idea, but there are 50 different implementations and 50 different protocols that are all just encoding this idea. And because of that, there's a humongous attack surface for one attacker to find a bug in any of these implementations and drain some funds. The other problem with all these implementations is that they have vendor lock-in, right? If I'm an application that wants to use your bridge, I have to encode sending funds to your lock smart contract with your function call. And if I ever want to move to a different bridge operator, I'll have to move my, upgrade my smart contract to change the address I sent to, change the message format, and whatever liquidity I had on your bridge, I would have to bring back and deploy again onto this new solution. So the switching costs for all these bridge, bridges are insanely high, and that creates vendor lock-in and the fragmentation that we see in the current bridging space. So, as I mentioned before, there are all these cons to the current bridging architectures that we see in Ethereum and other blockchain ecosystems. So enter IBC, the interoperability standard for all. Whenever you make a claim like that, this is the obligatory comic that you have to present. But uh, I really do think that IBC has the potential to be that global interoperability standard because it's an interoperability standard designed for all consensus mechanisms, not just Cosmos. It is application agnostic. It's consensus agnostic, and it introduces a standard set of messages for every layer of the stack, and each layer of the stack is cleanly abstracted. So we have a specification that is rigorously implemented and an implementation that has stood the test of time. So before we talk about IBC light clients, we'll have to talk about 
the IVC trust model. So IVC as a trust model is, minimize, is trust minimized by default. And what I mean by that is that we believe interoperability should be as secure as operability. When you're moving between chains, you're maybe, say, moving some MakerDAO tokens to Solana for a DEX, for example, you already are uh, trusting the validator sets of the two chains. So you're trusting uh, the Ethereum validator set and you're trusting the Solana validator set by default, just from the fact that you have to interact with these two chains. You're also, of course, trusting the correctness of the applications you use. But you shouldn't have to add any additional trust assumptions. And the current state of bridging in other cases is that you have this massive additional trust assumption in the bridge operator, which is, in most cases, centralized. And my feeling is the trust model is just as strong as your weakest link. And if everything that we do on blockchains is going to be interoperable in the future, and our interoperability is, requires a centralized um, source of trust, then why did we go through all the trouble of building the decentralized application in the first place? We could have just stuck with centralized systems and our lives would be much easier. So IBC is bringing the decentralized ethos not just to the applications that live at the endpoint, but to the interoperability standard itself. That being said, it is flexible and you can embed weaker trust models when necessary. As we said, maybe implementing a tenement light client on Ethereum is way too expensive you can be flexible and create your light client differently um, and get to Ethereum faster. But the benefit of using IBC to do that is that your light clients are up upgradable. Your trust model is not locked in. You can start somewhere and improve on it. And you don't have the vendor lock-in issues that we have with other bridging solutions. So, this is the structure of IBC. As I said, it's built as a layer of abstractions, and at the bottom of the layer is the light clients. And if you see these two chains trying to talk to each other, chain A has a light client of chain B, and chain B has a light client of chain A, and that's responsible for tracking the consensus and letting IBC know what's happening on the other chain rather than the centralized bridge operator. And this is the layer of abstraction that deals with figuring out what's happening on the other chain, so all this layers above it can just rely on this light client to give it that information. In, the, in this talk, I'm just gonna be talking about the lower level, but if you wanna ask me questions about the higher layers, I'm welcome to answer questions later. So, what is the purpose of an IBC light client? An IBC light client is responsible for doing three main things at the IBC protocol level. It follows the other chain's consensus, that means somehow we have to be able to tell what the, other light, like what the other chain is doing. So if I'm connecting Ethereum to Solana, Solana is making blocks, it's processing transactions, it's creating new state. We need some way of being able to track that on Ethereum. And that's what we would use a Solana light client for, for example. So we would follow and get trusted commitments of the application state. Using those trusted commitments, we would verify proofs that certain actions had taken place. For example, if an IBC packet was sent, we'll use one of these trusted commitments to verify, hey, on this block, an IBC packet got sent. And lastly, it needs to enforce the trust model that we use. So there's no point of having a trust model if you don't detect when that trust model is broken and take appropriate action, right? If our light client is continuing to to process transactions even after the trust model is broken, there's no point in the trust model in the first place. So, the following step. This is our update client interface, and as we said, our developers have a range of how to implement it. We recommend the trust minimize approach, which would be deploying a light client to, of the counterparty chain on your chain. So for example, if you're implementing from Ethereum to Tenement, this would be building an IBC Tenement client on Ethereum and a um, Ethereum client on Tenement. And that way you're actually verifying that the validator set of your counterparty chain has signed these headers. So you're no longer relying on a thir trusted third party, you're directly verifying the consensus of your counterparty chain. In the rollup case, it could look different because rollups don't necessarily have a validator set. Instead, in this case, the trust minimized approach might be a proof of the rollup block on the DA layer and then a fraud proof window uh, for getting fraud proofs to be submitted and maybe a snark verification in the zero knowledge case. Meanwhile, the trustful approach 
which is also supported, could just be deploying the bridge as a solo machine client, where again, you have this trusted operator that is signing attestations on what happened to the counterparty chain. So given that, IBC supports arbitrary commitment structures. So we have on the left side these different consensus algorithms, Tenement, Substrate, maybe a roll-up, and on the right side we have different commitment structures, maybe an IAVL tree, an SMT tree, an Ethereum RLP tree. So the left side is telling us what is the application state uh, commitment, right? Um, but the right side is how do we take that application state and verify that a particular action has taken place? For example, a packet has been sent. With ICS23, a standard in IBC, we can decouple this follow logic from the verify logic. So you can build your light client to follow a particular consensus and then support any tree structure that you wish using the ICS23 proof spec. If you really wish to and your particular uh, commitment structure is not a Merkle tree and can't be expressed in ICS23, you can also create a light client that embeds whatever unique verification you want inside it. So it could be doing a vertical commitment, it could be doing a ZK proof. IBC is pretty agnostic in how you choose to implement this. And so this is the verify step. And we have verify membership and verify non-membership, and there's a trust minimize approach. We're directly proving uh, that something has happened using a Merkle or vertical proof against the app hash, and then you have the trustful approach, which is a signature of the bridge committee. And lastly, there's enforcement, which is, again, enforcing that your trust model is actually working as you expect. And so this is our submit misbehavior method. And in the sovereign case, where we're talking between two sovereign chains, this would be basically your trust model is, did the validator set on the other chain completely go rogue and become malicious? And if it did, it's a, it might uh, be creating a light client attack against you, and you need to be able to detect that. So we support double signing protection, basically a fork, and if two different headers are signed by the validator set, IBC has the ability to detect that, and then we freeze the client and prevent any further verification until the dispute is resolved, let's say through on-chain governance. In the roll-up case, it's different, because we're not necessarily verifying consensus, but a particular state machine transition, and there we have this notion of fraud proofs that we can use. And then we might have the actual state machine of the entire roll-up, on uh, our light client, and we can execute fraud proofs against it to see if um, the sequencer has gone rogue. And in our case, depending on our trust model, we might completely freeze the roll-up client, or we might just remove that block from verification. So if there's anything you take away from this talk, it should be these three. IBC light client is, development is flexible. We have three main things that we're trying to do. On top of it, we want to follow counterparty chain consensus. We want to verify that certain actions have taken place uh, on the state machine, and we want to enforce our trust model. And how you do all three of those things are up to you. As a light client developer, you can implement it as you wish, depending on the consensus you're trying to uh, connect to and the trust model that you want to embed. And IBC, as a protocol, will use your light client as a clean abstraction layer using these three methods to connect to a chain and create applica whatever application packets you want to send across it. So IBC, it's capable of speed. It's capable of getting this fast deployment that you, we've seen in this third-party bridge operator case, but it's designed for longevity. It's designed to support the kind of inter interoperability we want to see in the future, where chains connect to each other without a centralized, trusted third party sitting in between. Thank you. I'm Aditya. If you have any questions about this later, we can talk. Hi, my name is Moritz from 42. Uh, I was wondering what your opinion is on the centralization of running relayers and how you think that is a problem or not. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. I kind of skipped over the relayers uh, for a particular reason, um, but I can bring them back in here. Cool. So uh, the question was, what do I think about the centralization of relayers? So relayers in IBC are meant to ferry packets and uh, updates of the consensus to the other chain. So as chain A is making blocks, 
it's a relayer that will actually take one of those headers and submit it to the chain B light client. And similarly, if a packet is getting sent from chain A, a relayer will be getting the packet and submitting it to chain B. But crucially, um, everything that a relayer sent, sends is being verified by the light client. So we do not rely on relayers as a correctness assumption. If the relayer sends us a malicious packet or an invalid packet, all of that is going to be rejected because we are directly verifying that against the consensus of the two chains. So we really only rely on relayers as a liveness assumption and anyone can relay. So right now in Cosmos, there are many different relayer operators and when I send a packet, it doesn't matter to me at all who relays. In fact, it could be, um, it could be a trusted relay, it could be a relayer operator I trust and know, that I know and trust, it could be a relayer operator I don't know, it could be myself, right? So we don't uh, rely on any specific relayer to uh, relay packets. They're just liveness. Um, they just help us with liveness. So for me, I don't actually see it as a, as a major problem for us. Do we have, oh, yes. Hey, Aditya, thanks for this wonderful presentation. So one question I had is, let's say there are 100 blockchains, right, which are being connected to Ethereum. Now running 100 light clients of these blockchains on Ethereum, won't it be very costly, specifically like given that how costly Ethereum is and the gas cost and everything there, right? So in that case, running like these light clients of so many blockchains on Ethereum and as we move forward with more and more blockchains, wouldn't it be very costly for this sort of a bridge to kind of move specifically just for Ethereum, not for other chains, but yeah. Yeah, that's, that's definitely true um, because uh, the most expensive part of IBC is actually this light client verification. So if you have 100 different um, light clients that you have to run on Ethereum and you're making uh, updates to them all the time and a lot of packets are going through, that could, I agree, become very, very expensive. Um, so I expect that at least in the immediate term, while, Ethereum, while transacting on L1 is still expensive, we might have certain things that go through hubs, right? So uh, those 100 chains might be speaking to one particular uh, hub chain that then speaks to Ethereum. So you reduce the amount of traffic that goes through uh, the L1 directly. Um, but I could imagine also as time goes on and Ethereum improves and things go on L2s, there actually won't be that much traffic on L1 necessarily. Maybe all these 100 chains are going to be speaking to 100 different rollups on Ethereum. Right, and so then I think the calculus changes a lot, and the the cost for one rollup to speak to the applications that it's particularly interested in might not be very high. Um, so yeah. One more quick, qu sorry. One more quick question. Hi. Yeah. Uh, the only question I have is because you mentioned you worked on Plasma, I'm curious to hear what do you think are the biggest downsides of using Plasma. Uh, I haven't worked on Plasma in a very, very long time. Um, it really was just a talk about this is the predecessor to rollups. I actually am not so aware of the current state of Plasma. At the time that I was building it, it was purely for um, token transfer. And so I think the architecture of rollups I find more interesting because they can do the sort of gen general um, applications that we see on sovereign app chains. Um, so yeah, generally I've been more focused on, on the Ethereum side roll-up architectures. All right. Let's give another round of applause to Aditya from the ICF.